Hello, this is a quick video version of a talk that I gave at Winchester School of Art in November 2012. It's looking at the relationship between the internet and creativity in terms of disruptive innovation. It's based on a chapter I've written for a book called Digital World, edited by Gillian Youngs. My name's David Gauntlet, that's me there, I'm talking now. So the idea of disruptive innovation is based on work by Clayton Christensen and it's basically the idea of uh, nimble, cheap newcomers surprisingly coming from nowhere and disrupting the status quo. I've divided this talk into three strands. So in the first one, you've got everyday creativity of users disrupting the traditional professional media ecosystem. In the second one, you've got uh, sort of a new breed of academics disrupting the traditional approach of media and communication studies. And in the third one, you've got everyday people disrupting the dominant position of professional arts and humanities scholars. I'll explain each of these as we go along. So in the first, we're talking about an ecosystem. The point about an ecosystem is that when one part changes or something new comes along then everything else has to adapt and change necessarily so in a media ecosystem even if you're in a bit where you're not interested in the internet and you think the internet has got nothing to do with you nevertheless the arrival of the internet has an impact on the ecosystem and everybody else has to shift and change and move around in response so we're all familiar with the idea of ordinary people making media themselves. People do it on YouTube, they do it on blogs, they create Wikipedia. That's what people have done. You might have seen before a pyramid where at the top there's typically like a sort of 1% of people who actually create stuff online. Everybody else is seen as more of a consumer of online stuff. People used to use that pyramid to show that those who are excited about people making and sharing stuff online were misguided because most people didn't do it. However, newer data, this is from late 2011, shows that the creators are broadening. This chart has got people who have published a blog, made their own web pages, made their own video or audio and put it online. And here you see it's broadening out so that about a quarter of people online are actually in this creator mode now. So things are changing. Of course, that's what they do. So a lot of this stuff is what I talked about in my book Making is Connecting where I'm not going to talk about any of those points now because there's another video on YouTube which takes you through all of this stuff. But in the end I say it's like guerrilla gardening. It's people who want to do something and they do it. They don't ask for permission. They don't wait for somebody to give them permission or tell them what to do. They just do it because they want to. So the kind of disruptions we're talking about. Uh, here I've broken it down into four there's probably even more one is on how people spend their time with media a second is on the very fact that you can make things now you can make and share things online i think it changes our psychological orientation to all media even if you're not actually doing it yourself third there's the huge change in what's available we no longer just have to consume a narrow ish body of stuff offered by the mass media but can also choose from the long tail in other words, if you take a mass media view, well then you think that the long tail of stuff you can find online is irrelevant because none of it is very popular. But the reality is, when you consider it all together, it's just as popular, if not more popular, than the small amount of stuff which is obviously successful because it has a large audience. But fourth, what I seem to have been saying in the previous three points is rather a broadcast kind of point of view. In fact, what's most important is the connections and collaborations which link together all of this DIY stuff. Crucially, they are part of networks and communities. So that's the first case. In the second one, you've got people who actually understand the potential of the internet disrupting the traditional approach of media and communication studies. On the one hand, you have books like this one, Misunderstanding the Internet, which on the cover says it aims to challenge both popular myths and existing academic orthodoxies surrounding the Internet. But what I'm saying is this is actually the status quo, where you take a sort of critical stance and go yah-boo about the Internet and basically wish it would go away. I'm not saying that any kind of critical left-wing perspectives are guilty of this, of course. You could take the example of Christian Fuchs, who has a trenchant Marxist critique of what certain companies 
do online and the ways in which they extract value from the internet. But at the same time, he understands the potential of the internet as he's got an open access journal and uses that as a platform for people to do interesting things online. So here, for example, there's a number of claims which don't really add up because the evidence they present doesn't connect with the claims that are being made. We haven't really got time to get into it here, but it seems to be driven by a nostalgia for a time when you had newspapers and didn't have the internet, even though newspapers are obviously an elite form of publication and the internet enables a much broader, more diverse array of people to have a voice. Initiatives such as open access and publicly funded platforms rather than commercial platforms would be some of the interesting alternatives we'd want to look at here. The third case I think is an interesting one because you've got ordinary people doing stuff which was previously done by arts and humanities scholars and people who worked in museums or galleries. So for example in the online game Minecraft you've got ordinary people doing things like uh, recreating Cologne Cathedral, recreating 1930s New York, recreating a Roman villa there, or creating 3D versions of literary worlds such as this is Hogwarts Castle from the Harry Potter books. Similarly on Pinterest you've got people curating collections of old postcards, stuff about design, stuff about architecture, and this isn't necessarily exactly what professional academics did previously and it's been taken over by amateurs but it's an interesting challenge to the status and authority of the people who we previously thought had status and authority it's a bit like what happened with wikipedia where we found that ordinary people can make an encyclopedia that's mostly better than professional encyclopedia makers can make and one thinks here also of the MOOC the massively open online course where you've got courses offered on a massive scale online and for free which are challenging the business model of universities even though some of them are actually offered by universities. That's the end of this quick run through my three strands. Hopefully it's given you something to think about. These are three different sorts of ways in which the internet brings about the possibility of disrupting what happened before. And although we might be used to thinking of disruption as a bad thing, I think here we can see that disruption is exciting, brings about new stuff, and reinvigorates our culture.